I got a pretty pigeonholed objective this week um, that doesn't have a significant amount of material on it in the literature and stuff. But my question is, the kidney involvement with thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. So in order to make the video a little bit more substantial, I'm going to go through what TTP is and put it into perspective of a larger picture and then also talk about the kidney involvement. So when we think about disorders of platelets or platelet disorders, you can think about them in terms of are they, are they a problem with not producing enough platelets? Are we over consuming the platelets or sequestering the platelets? Or is there a problem with the platelet itself? So for example, you can have problems with the platelets that are intrinsic. For example, Bernard Soulier and Glanzman thrombosthenia where the receptors on the platelets are defective. In splenomegaly, you can actually cause the sequestration of platelets. If the megakaryocytes are not working properly or if they're being crowded out of the bone marrow through, uh, through some type of neoplastic disorder, then you can have underproduction. And then you can also have overconsumption. Overconsumption represents things like DIC. It also represents things like TTP, even though these two things are uh, completely different. Now, TTP itself falls under another category called thrombotic microangiopathy. So there are at least nine well-described thrombotic microangiopathies, also called TMAs. And so what is a thrombotic microangiopathy? is basically where you have platelet uh, activation and, and aggregation within the microvasculature. So imagine you have your large vessel... And then branching off from that, you have a medium-sized vessel. Branching off from that, you have the smaller arterioles. And they get even smaller all the way down to, over here, you'd have capillaries. Somewhere in between those, uh, sm those small arterioles and the capillaries, you have this microvasculature. And inside that microvasculature, you will have thrombotic microangiopathies. That's where they all occur. Now, all of the nine are associated with acute kidney failure except for TTP. With TTP you have renal involvement, but the renal involvement is usually very minor and you usually don't get a full acute kidney failure. You definitely almost never get chronic kidney failure except for in hereditary uh, TTP and we'll talk about hereditary versus acquired as well. So I want to review each of the thrombotic microangiopathies and discuss the renal involvement of each. So here they are listed out by their name and their cause. Now this is adapted from a 2014 article published in New England Journal of Medicine. Now TTP, inherited and acquired, are both due to defects in Adam TS13. I'll talk about what that is, but you'll notice that in hereditary you have mutations in the gene, and in the acquired, you have antibodies that inhibit this enzyme that, that the gene produces. Now, in this article, it abandons some of the more, uh, I would call them classic names. For example, what, was, what we now call complement-mediated TMA used to be called HUS. And then, for example, uh, what we call shigatoxin-mediated TMA used to be called shigatoxin-mediated HUS. And HUS stands for hemolytic uremic syndrome. So hemolytic uremic syndrome is a thrombotic microangiopathy. It is similar to, but very distinct from, an Adam TS13 deficiency, or TTP. Now I'll point out that the older names, the, the more common names, TTP, HUS, these are names that describe uh, clinical findings that were that were common, uh, especially as far back as like 19, I think it was 1924 or 1944 when they were first being described. These were words that would describe clinical findings. But now we're getting away from that because the clinical findings can overlap so much and we're getting to trying to name them based off of what the primary deficiency is. So as a quick review of the primary hemostasis, you'll remember that step one, you have vasoconstriction. And then step two, you would have von Willebrand factor. Von Willebrand factor would bind to subendothelial collagen. And 
What may be easier than listing these out is to just draw it for you. So here we have subendothelial collagen going through. And on top of that subendothelial collagen, we have endothelial cells. When the endothelial cells get damaged, so we have damage right here, it exposes the subendothelial collagen, and then von Willebrand factor can come and bind to that. Then the platelets, the platelets will come and, and through a receptor called GP1B, the GP1B receptor will bind to von Willebrand factor. Next you get platelet degranulation, so they'll degranulate. Those granules will let out ADP, they'll let out thromboxane A2, they'll let out calcium. So the platelet changes shape when it binds to von Willebrand factor. As it changes shape, it causes degranulation. ADP comes back and causes the expression of GP2B3A. So I have my GP2B3A, and I'll also have other, other platelets in the area that will, that will uh, interact with the ADP, and they will all express GP2B3A. And when they do, you can have fibrinogen come in here and bind. That fibrinogen, then you have the clotting cascade. I'll just put CC up here. The clotting cascade will zoom down through. At the end of the clotting cascade, it turns this fibrinogen into fibrin. So fibrin crosslinking. Now I want to point out, remember that this clotting cascade is typically initiated by tissue factor. And tissue factor comes from damaged endothelial cells. So this will leak out tissue factor that can start the clotting cascade and turn the fibrinogen into fibrin. So I went ahead and drew for you a schematic linear representation of what von, Willow, von Willebrand factor monomers look like. So um, von Willebrand factor, you have different domains, D1, D2, a D prime domain, a D3, A1, 2, and 3, a D4, B1, 2, 3, C1 and 2, and then CK. Now let me point out a few things about uh, these different domains. So the D prime, D3 domain, this binds to uh, clotting factor 8. The A1 domain, this is the area that binds to the GP1B receptor. The A2 domain, I'm going to put a star right here. This is the domain that's cleaved by Adam TS13. And the cleavage site is actually a tyrosine methionine, so it's tyrosine methionine, and it's, I think, 1605 and 1606. Between the 1605-1606 amino acid, tyrosine methionine, and the A2 domain, that's what Adam TS13 cleaves. Now, the A3 domain, this, what, this is what binds, let me pull this down so we can see. It's A3, this is what binds subendothelial collagen. This is a collagen binding site. Now there's two other things I want to point out. So the C1 domain, this domain actually has some affinity for the GP2B3A, for the GP2B3A receptor. So we really think of GP2B3A as binding to fibrinogen, but this C1 domain has some affinity for that receptor as well. And then on the CK domain, this is going to have a sulfhydryl group. So you have that sulfhydryl group, which allows it to form disulfide bonds. So this can actually form a disulfide bond with another CK domain, allowing it to form dimers. So let's take a look at this big picture. We have these various domains in von Willebrand factor, and all of them are important. And you can just imagine at this end forming another monomer going all the way down. And at the very end you have D1 over here, whereas we have D1 on this side over here. So that would form a dimer. So I want you to think of it like this. So here's one dimer. And this is basically my D domains going all the way up to my C domains. The sulfhydryl group, the C domains, D domains. Of course... I, I have omitted them, but the A1, 2, and 3 domains are in here as well. I just haven't drawn them in with the colors. But this would be one full dimer, and then this dimer will sort of layer on top of another dimer. And this will keep on going, so I could put another one down here, for example, with, with that. And then we make the dimer down here. 
and I've actually got to change that to purple and then come on over and we can keep doing this and this is uh, this is a Von Willebrand factor multimer and these multimers are how they're produced and excreted from endothelial cells and then Adam TS13 has to come into that A2 site and cleave it here, and it'll 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 cut these things up into smaller uh, molecules of von Willebrand factor. And when you run these on a gel, you're going to see von Willebrand factor uh, multiple multimers in in several different uh, uh, sizes. So you're going to see some of them. So if we imagine this is our electrophoresis gel, we're going to see some uh, extremely large um, multimers. Then we're going to see some that are cleaved a little bit, and some that are cleaved a little bit more, and some that are cleaved more, and some that are cleaved all the way down as far as they'll go. So there is a continuum based on. So as soon as that that big multimer gets secreted from the cell, some of it will be acted on immediately and some of it will float through the serum a little bit before it gets acted on, but eventually it'll all get cut up into smaller and smaller pieces by Adam TS13. Now here's the problem with that. So some of it, so here we have our endothelial cells and this is inside of a capillary or some type of arterial or capillary. They can excrete these multimers either as globules, globular form, out here in the serum or they can secrete them attached to and anchored to the endothelial cell. Now what I couldn't tease out was whether or not, and I couldn't find this in the literature, I don't know whether or not these anchored molecules are in globular form or if they're in linear and open form, but it, it does seem to matter and here's why, because the pathophysiology of this is, is this. If this is my globular uh, von Willebrand factor, so let me label it von Willebrand factor, this is my globular von Willebrand factor, then it actually has its binding site. I'm going to put the binding site or the, the, the cleavage site, the A2 domain, I'm going to put it right here. It's in the middle. It's in the middle of this globule and it's not accessible to Adam TS13. So let me draw in my Adam TS13. It's a big a big wedge that wants to come in here like a knife and cut, but it, it can't get to its its active site. It can't get right here to the A2 domain because it's in the middle of this globule. And so what has to happen, and actually this is going to be a whole bunch of von Willebrand factors, and so we can, we can draw a whole bunch of different uh, uh, A2 domains, but the thing is all of them are hidden within this globule, and the only way that Adam TS13 can get to the active site is under high shear stress. So let me write that out. High shear stress. Where do we have high shear stress within the vasculature? We have high shear stress within the capillaries and the arterioles. So I'll put capillaries and arterioles. Within the venous side, there is not a high shear stress. And the larger the diameter, you can remember from Purcell's law, we can think of shear stress. Shear stress is going to be a function of resistance. And resistance, you can remember, is measured by Purcell's law. So it's a, it's a function of, of a couple of things. But one of those is the flow rate. And the other one is the radius of the vessel. So as the flow rate is really high and the radius is really small, or the velocity is really high and the radius is really small, then you have a high resistance or a high shear stress. So that shear stress... You'll remember shear stress is the one thing that actually helps prevent coagulation. It causes all of the all of the platelets and everything else. So remember we have our, our vessel here and then we can say that the shear stress is highest at the wall surface uh, but the, the velocity is highest in the middle. So velocity is highest in the middle, shear stress is highest at the wall because it's basically uh, the slow it's the wall of the vessel is uh, impairing the flow of, of the fluid causing the shear stress. It's two forces butting up against each other. And so that actually causes all of the, the particles in here to move away from the side and move toward the center of the vessel. So we have this 
this mechanism, this physics mechanism that's preventing, uh, that's preventing thrombi formation. And we also have this mechanism up here where whenever there's high shear stress, it allows Adam TS13 to cleave von Willebrand factor. Well, here's the paradox of it all. Because the high sh not only, actually let's zoom back in, not only is that A2 domain uh, uh, hidden from, from activation, but also the A1 domain that binds to GP2, uh, GP1B, I'm going to try to make it in orange. So that A1 domain that's right next to the A2 domain, it's also hidden. And it also becomes open and, and visible in areas of high shear stress. So whenever there's high shear stress, if, if Adam TS13 can't come in and cut it, if there's a deficiency, then the high shear stress is going to cause uh, the activation of von Willebrand factor because the, the platelets will then be able to access the binding site of von Willebrand factor. So platelets, platelets access the VF, or VWF, let me write that right, the VWF binding site. And again, we said we have high shear stress in the capillaries and the arterioles. In other words, we have high shear stress in the microvasculature. That's why this is called a microangiopathic uh, process because you have the platelets able to aggregate and bind to von Willebrand factor in areas of high shear stress, i.e. in the microvasculature. And remember, we're equating shear stress with resistance. We're equating shear stress with resistance. And so we can say in areas that have very low resistance in the microvasculature, you would expect to have very, very little thrombi formation. In areas with high resistance in the microvasculature, you would expect more thrombi formation. So for example, the pulmonary vasculature has very little resistance. In fact, it has 100% of the cardiac output flowing through it at the same time that, that only... Uh, that, that the cardiac output would flow through the rest of the body. So the resi and it's going through a low pressure system. So the resistance has to be low in the pulmonary circuitry. Therefore, shear stress has to be low, and you would expect very little pulmonary involvement with TTP. And in fact, that's what you find. So let's go back and see what I said. I said that von Willebrand factor is produced in massive multimers. Then it's cleaved by Adam TS13. The cleavage site of the globular form, it's only accessible when the von Willebrand factor unfolds, and it unfolds in areas of high shear stress. Some endothelial cells may express von Willebrand factor on the surface. We are not sure whether or not these require shear stress. Failure of Adam TS13 to cleave the multimer allows von Willebrand factor to bind to platelets. The platelets can only access the binding site when it's unfolded in high shear stress areas. This is why the microvasculature is involved and not the, the larger arteries. So here's a chart and I've got the references at the end of this. Um, I got this from a research paper and it shows the, the shear stress based on what kind of vessel you're in. So the ascending aorta, the descending aorta, the conduit arteries, then you have the arterioles and the capillaries, this microvasculature, of course the venules uh, to a much, much lesser degree, but the arterioles and the capillaries where you have the highest shear stress, this is where you would expect these kind of uh, forces, these kind of factors to impact and have an effect with TTP. And in fact, that is what you see. So I never actually found any paper or any source that said you could predict which organs are involved based on shear stress. This is a hypothesis of my own, and I think that it works out quite well. I did find a lot of papers that say that shear stress is involved in the unfolding and the access of Adam TS13 with von Willebrand factor, but I didn't find one that specifically said this, so I want to point out this is my personal hypothesis, but it makes a lot of sense, and it's a good way to think of the pathology of the disease to help you understand it.
In other words, where there's very low resistance, you have low shear stress, and you, have, uh, you don't have TTP involvement. And so, for example, that would be the lungs. So what are the clinical manifestations? You can think of what percentage of blood flow goes to a specific area because uh, remember resistance is going to be a, uh, a factor. It's going to depend on the amount of flow and it's also going to depend on the radius. And, and so if you think of the flow, you have a lot of flow going to muscles and so you have impact on the muscles with weakness. You have uh, a lot of flow going to the brain so you have neurological deficits. Specifically, you're going to have headaches but you can also have somnolence and, and or focal deficits. Abdominal pain, you have a, I think it's like 22% of your cardiac output goes to the, uh, to the GI system. Uh, that's also explaining the nausea and the vomiting. And then if it's not rapidly treated, you can have a seizure and sometimes even sudden death. So and then you also have the renal uh, vasculature. The renal uh, blood flow gets about 20 or 25 percent. Some, some sources will say 15 percent of the cardiac output, but that's still a significant amount. And it will explain that you have a lot of flow going into the small area, so you have a high shear stress, and you have renal involvement. So TTP used to be diagnosed as a pentad clinically. Um, this You don't have to have all of these anymore if you find a deficiency in Adam TS13. Uh, the pentad was you had microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Again, so this is explained because you have these uh, this platelet thrombi within the microvasculature, and then whenever you had a red blood cell going across it, it would go across it and it would shear and you would have hemolytic anemia. You're using up all of your platelets as you're forming these, these uh, von Willebrand factor platelet aggregates, and so you get thrombocytopenia, the renal failure, that you don't have renal failure very often in, in TTP, so this may have been the confluence or the conf uh, conflating uh, TTP with other types of TMAs. So the other thrombotic microangiopathies do often present with renal failure, acute and chronic, whereas TTP only rarely do you have chronic renal failure, and that's typically with the hereditary form. The neurologic findings, thats you get a lot of blood flow to the brain, so that explains that. Um, and then fever. Neurologic findings are typically more common, in fact, than renal failure. However, you almost always have renal involvement. Okay, let me quickly explain the other ones. I can't give you a good reason for, on most of these, I can't give you a good reason for why they're isolated to the microvasculature, but I can tell you their mechanisms. So for complement-mediated TMA, which used to be called HUS, for this one you have either an overactive, overactive classical pathway, or I'm sorry, alternative pathway, alternative pathway, Overactive uh, alternative pathway. Uh, remember that the alternative pathway, I'll come down here. The alternative pathway is that C3 will spontaneously split into C3B and C3A. And it'll do that spontaneously, but you have things on your cell surface that say no. It's like a stop sign on the cell surface, and I'm not very good at drawing, but imagine that's a stop sign. It's saying Hell no, you're not going to come here and activate on top of this cell surface. So it stops the activation of that alternate complement pathway. But if C3 were to like spontaneously split really, really fast a whole bunch of times, then it could overcome these defense mechanisms. So I put up here that it could be overactive alternative pathway or it could be a decrease in the inhibitors. So this is a decrease of function in complement activation inhibitors or an increase in function in complement activation. So you have things like complement factor H and complement factor I, that would be the stop sign. This would be complement factor H and complement factor I. These things, if they are decreased in function, it would be the same as if C3A, C3B were spontaneously increasing in function. And there's actually several different 
uh, inhibitory mechanisms that can prevent the complement uh, from activating, typically on endothelial and on platelets. So this, this cell represents an endothelial cell and it also represents a platelet. So this can happen on both of them. And whenever it's activated on the platelet, it can, it can lead to thrombocytopenia. When it activates on the endothelial cell, it leads to endothelial damage, and you can get uh, thrombus formation from that endothelial damage. So the first thing I want to point out, you've already seen, is that with this other, with other types of TMA, you actually get endothelial damage. With TTP, you didn't get endothelial damage. There was no endothelial damage with TTP. That's why tissue factor was not released. When tissue factor was not released, you don't get fibrin activation. Another mutation is MMACHC. This is basically enzymes involved in the metabolism of cobalamin, which is vitamin B12. Whenever that happens, you get a buildup of methylmalonic acid, and you also get a, a buildup of homocysteine. So you get homocysteine urea, methylmalonic acid urea. And both of these uh, chemicals are, are toxic to the endothelial cells of the microvasculature. And so you get endothelial damage, and it's also somewhat toxic to the platelets. So you get platelet damage, platelet dysfunction. And I, and I want to point out the complement, I'll just go back to the complement mediator really quick. When the complement is activated on the platelet surface, it can actually activate the platelet right there from complement activation. So you get platelet uh, activation through endothelial damage where the endothelial damage causes uh, thrombus formation uh, through the normal pathway to, to repair the endothelial damage. And then you also get platelet activation through uh, complement-induced platelet activation. And then again, you can have platelet activation in this one as well. The next thing is called coagulation-mediated TMA. And basically, this is a, a mutation in diacylglycerol kinase uh, epsilon and uh, what that basically uh, it's a, this this enzyme is associated with thrombomodulin plasminogen and protein kinase C so you can see if you have a defect in an enzyme that's supposed to control and, and interact with thrombomodulin plasminogen and protein kinase C a defect in that would lead to uh, overactivation of coagulation and platelet, uh, you would have consumption of platelets. But I think more important than that is that this coagulation pathway can actually feed back into the complement. It can actually feed back into complement pathways and cause platelet uh, complement activation as well. So it's sort of a more complex pathway than the others, but it, it's uh, an interesting one at that. All right, now we're going to acquired disorders. Acquired TTP, it's the same thing as, as hereditary TTP, except in this case, the Adam TS13 uh, enzyme is not deficient. It's being inhibited by antibodies. Now, shigatoxin-mediated TMA, shigatoxin will actually go into endothelial cells and bind to the ribosomes binds to the ribosomes and prevents protein translation. So you actually have preventing of protein translation and when you do that it actually damages the endothelial cells. But it also has a mechanism where it can cause the secretion of von Willebrand factor. So you're doing two things. First of all you're causing with the sugar toxin you're causing von Willebrand factor multipmers to be secreted and, you're, and, and it's causing it to do it in mass more than it would have otherwise. And it's also inhibiting protein synthesis, causing the endothelial cell to be damaged, and eventually it can die. So again, a difference between these TTPs and the other disorders is that in, in TTP, you do not have endothelial damage. Drug-mediated TMA, I shouldn't have to say much about this. We've seen this with a lot of other diseases, for example, with drug-induced lupus. The, the Bottom line is that having a drug, for example, in this one, quinine is, is, is uh, very implicated, but having a specific drug 
can cause the drug-dependent production of an antibody against many different types of cells. Again, cell damage. All right, drug-mediated TMA toxic dose. So that was immunologic, but there's also another drug mediated that's uh, through toxic dose. Uh, a lot of mechanisms have been proposed. There's a, ve a mechanism of VEGF inhibition, and this is the one I have to say I, I know the least about and understand the least, and, and of course I didn't read much about it either. So just as we can have genetic deficits in complement, we can have uh, antibody inhibition of specific complement. For example, I talked about the complement factor H being an inhibitor of complement activation on cell surfaces, and that complement factor H can be inhibited by antibodies, producing a, another complement-mediated TMA, but in this, in this case, again, it's an acquired disorder. So all of that to say kidney involvement. So with TMAs, you have TTP versus non-TTP. With, non, with, with other causes of thrombo, uh, thrombotic microangiopathies, endothelial cells are damaged, and in all of these, kidney failure is common. Kidney failure common. Because you're damaging the endothelial cells and causing uh, vascular occlusion. With TTP, the only thing you're getting is vascular occlusion. You're not damaging any endothelial cells. So you'll get renal involvement, but you'll rarely see renal failure. So what happens in, and so there's a difference though in between hereditary and acquired. With hereditary, what you need to know is that podocytes are known producers of Adam TS13. So if you have a hereditary disease, if you have a, a mutation in Adam TS13, the podocytes can't produce it. They can't produce it now, they can't produce it then, they can't produce it ever. Or if they are producing it, it's defective. Whereas in the acquired version, those podocytes can still, can still let's see, this is a podocyte, they can still pump out Adam TS13. Uh, but and if they do it fast enough, they can do it before any antibodies bind to it and and inactivate it. So with the hereditary uh, causes of of Adam TS thirteen deficiency, you have a higher uh, predilection for renal damage than in the acquired version. The other aspect of that is with the hereditary, you have a higher a, a higher recurrence rate, and so. The bottom line is hereditary TTP, you have a higher chance of having chronic renal failure, whereas acquired you have almost zero chance of renal failure, acute or chronic, but it will uh, somewhat depend on the recurrence rate. Now in TTP, what you'll see is um, thrombi that are platelet rich, and they'll be in the glomerulus typically, so I'm talking specifically about the renal involvement. You'll have platelet-rich thrombi in the glomerulus. And so another thing I want to point out is that although it's platelet-rich, it tends to be fibrin-poor. It may have fibrinogen, but not fibrin because we haven't damaged any endothelial cells and we haven't released tissue factor. You need tissue factor to start the, start the clotting cascade. So, clotting cascade. And without that clotting cascade, it won't go and turn fibrinogen into fibrin. So you can have fibrinogen, but no fibrin. It'll be a fibrin-poor thrombus. Now, there can be some fibrin. There can be some activation of the clotting cascade, but it's generally very, very low level if it happens. And because of that, when you do a D-dimer, the D-dimer can be normal, meaning zero, or only modestly elevated. It's variable, but it's always low. Now here's a picture of the of the glomerulus and what you're going to see here here's your platelet clot this is called a platelet fibrin clot but um, the amount of fibrin here you, in order to know how much it was you'd have to do uh, molecular staining and stuff so it's called a platelet fibrin clot but it's probably very fibrin poor and uh, you'll see that this is the this is the Bowman's capsule. This is the glomerulus, and this can this is very isolated. It's in one spot. It's not in several different spots, and that's that's typical of TTP. It might be like a clot right here, but not anywhere else. In this case, it just happens to be right here in this area.
You can also see the uh, the renal tubular uh, areas where you have the tubules. Uh, the, there's no involvement anywhere else. There's no involvement in the peritubular capillaries. It just tends to be in the glomerulus and it tends to be isolated to one spot within the glomerulus. All right, these are the sources I used. I hope that helped. Um, Harrison's was not very helpful, but I did use it. A lot of uh, primary literature. The best two articles I read, um, this Nijam article for uh, microangiopathy was pretty good. But this article in Minerva Medica, the kidney and thrombo thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, 2008 article, it actually better explained the mechanism of how shear stress induces the microangiopathy.